else you can see out the window. Yeah, you can. <laughs> You're live. You can go okay. right ahead. All right. Okay. All right. So I want to say a very big thank you to Derek Presbyterian for hosting me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak about uh, the work that I do in Haiti. So I'll start with um, anytime you go somewhere, it's always a good idea to try and learn as much of the local language as you can. So, bonjour, so basically I said, good morning, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the group called Reach Out La Fond. Thank you for having me. And my name is Dr. Ryan Craig. So I'm um, going to sort of start with a bit of a story and a bit of a discussion about what, uh, what vision is and what Reach Out does. So um, a lot of times, sometimes in our organization, the people talk a lot about vision. What does vision mean? So vision is not necessarily what you do. Your vision is what the world would look like if what you had in your dreams were to come true. So um, Reach Out the Fund is working towards making a better future for Haiti, specifically to serve Christ and raise up the youth of Haiti to become the leaders of tomorrow. Um, so talking a little bit more about Haiti, just to give you a perspective, I'm sure probably some of you have at least been there or know a little bit about it. Um, as you know, Haiti has a long history. It was sort of founded under leadership of Jean-Jacques Dessalines after a successful slave revolt against their French masters. Um, they celebrate this, their freedom, every New Year by eating a specific dish called soup jumou. Uh, soup jumou is a pumpkin dish that was formerly only allowed to be eaten by the white masters. And so every year, the Haitians enjoy their New Year. And it's a huge celebration and they enjoy eating soup jumou. So Haiti, um, was once, despite what it is now, known as the Pearl of the Antilles. It was the richest country in the New World. Um, that richness was based off of sugarcane and coffee. Um, however, after the colonialism and the successful slave revolt, the Europeans, the Americans, and the majority of the world uh, set up trade barriers where we no longer would trade anything with Haiti or have any dealings with them. Um, and they also, France also imposed a huge uh, debt burden on them that they said um, the Haitians owed them uh, for uh, when they took over their country. So currently, Haiti continues to struggle under weak leadership and gang warfare. Um, Haiti is one of the few places in the world besides Libya and some of the Eastern European countries where slavery uh, still exists. In Haiti, slavery takes the form of childhood slavery. Um, those children are known as restaviks. And restaviks are child slaves. They're usually children of families who live in the country or poor families in the city. And they'll be unable to afford their children, and so they sell them to a, uh, families who have a little bit more money in the city. And then those children usually sleep outside, often tied up, and they are expected to do all of the household duties and chores. Um, they have no education and no hope for the future. Um, they are also, some other statistics just about the children in Haiti in general, it's uh, over 80% of Haitian children do not finish high school. and. Junior's involvement, Junior who is Haitian, um, he grew up as a star soccer player, so he had a lot of promise and potential and was sort of looked after. However, he suffered a severe injury and that sort of injured his soccer career. So then he was forced to go back to where he grew up and a lot of that was in and around the gangs in Haiti. Um, there's a significant portion of Haiti today that is controlled and is under uh, gang leadership. Um, 
his wife Jamie, who founded Reach Out the Fund, she went to Haiti, as I said, in the mid two uh, thousands, and she decided and was led by God to f make Haiti her home and to figure out a way to help the youth of Haiti. Um, so Jamie and Junior's vision and the vision of Reach Out La Fond is a world of children that do not know hunger, are not forced into childhood slavery, and making these children that we're working with the leaders of tomorrow such that Haiti can once again become the most beautiful and productive island in the Caribbean. So we'll talk a little bit about what we try not to do first. So as a lot of you know who may have been on missions in the past, mission work is very tricky. Uh, mission work uh, takes cultural awareness and an understanding and now the people there will have, and now the people there will have clean water. So you go in, you dig the well, and now you've just put out of work all the people whose job it was to bring water into that town or that city. Um, we can talk about clothes. So after the earthquake, there was an immediate need, but then people just kept sending clothes and clothes. And so that put out of work all the people in Haiti whose job it was to make clothes. Um, also interesting, talking about cultural awareness, uh, one of the, they received a lot of winter coats, winter hats, mm -hmm. and gloves in Haiti, which isn't necessarily something that they can use in Haiti. Um, other things um, that you do is when you're doing mission work, um, sometimes there is an immediate need that the, the, there's a medical problem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, I'll try not to get emotional, about my, I was thinking about talking this. So um, the hospitals in Haiti are often undersupplied. Um, and I was working with a young man who had just graduated medical school, and his dream was to become an OBGYN, and he was going to do his residency in the States. Uh, his name was Schneider, and Schneider and I had been friends for, for quite some time. Um, he started working with some of the mission teams um, we worked with way back after the earthquake. And he had sickle cell anemia, and he and I had just called. He was setting up a clinic where I was serving as someone, a resource to, for him where he could call and ask me questions if he had a question about a patient who was a new medical school graduate. Didn't actually even receive his degree because in Haiti, even though he graduated, it takes sometimes several months for you to get that actual piece of paper. So Schneider had an attack of sickle cell anemia and went to the hospital where there were no supplies, such as IV fluids, and died. Um, so it was a great loss to Haiti and a great great loss in my friend. Um, so those things obviously sometimes there's immediate needs like getting those supplies there. But with the organization that I work out, um, our goal is to help teach these children to figure out things that are on their own, to rise up, to learn, and to be able to be a part of the Haitian solution. Um, one of the problems that these children face is a lot of times, if children don't become rest of X, sometimes they're dropped in front of the doors of orphanages. And while there are some amazing orphanages in Haiti, there are also some who basically serve as nothing more than uh, way houses for these children. Uh, they are not run well. They receive government funds. The children aren't fed. Um, they do not get an education, and then once they age out of the orphanage, or some of the young women become um, early teenage mothers and they're kicked out of the orphanages, then they're back on the streets and they don't have any skills to survive, and so they oftentimes that leads to them joining gangs. So while there are some very amazing orphanages in Haiti, there is a lot that are not so much. Um, so, in terms of doing mission, we need vision, cultural awareness, and a plan to help people rise as opposed to do something to ease what, what I call our white guilt. And you also need God. Um, as missionaries, it's not about you, it's about giving to the people. It's about giving the people you're helping dignity, um, teaching them to fish as it were. Um, 
oftentimes, as I said, sometimes there's immediate need and things just need to be given. But things that are given freely are not often valued as much as when you provide the opportunities for people to work, to gain education, to gain advancement, and to give them a sense of dignity and pride in who they are. So, on to that. Um, what my organization does is we work directly with children and we sponsor children to be able to go to school and we sponsor teachers to come to those schools and provide an education that might be a little bit different than the standard education that they're receiving. So education in Haiti is based off a of very classical education, but a lot of that is rote memorization and knowing how to sort of verbatim speak back things. It's not a lot of focus on problem solving or skill that you are building. So um, there are some pictures that I brought that you can pass around um, showing what Jamie and Junior do. So Jamie and Junior often work with the children um, and they, what they bring is the idea of team building and problem solving, but also we employ Haitian patients to work directly with the children who have been involved, who know how to problem solve. And so a lot of what we do is you know, teaching them how to make things, how to sew, how to do construction work, how to do mechanical work. Um, we have a robotics class where we're teaching them robotics. We have a class where they're, they're learning construction, learning plumbing. All these things are hard skills that they don't graduate high school with. Um, and so it's, it's a means to have them make a little bit of money when they become adults so that they can go out on their own and aren't tempted to join in the easy path, which is joining a gang. Um, it started sort of, the Haitians, when they graduate, are living in, in a constant fear of kidnappings, gang, gang violence, street riots. And when these kids age out of high school, a lot of the instigators and gang leaders look at them because they know they don't have any other so um, I mentioned before about 80% of the youth that go to school drop out after elementary school. They live ashamed and don't have hope for the future. Um, so Junior and Jamie are working with those kids. And they um, basically are trying to reach up these children through education and needs to get better. So the program started with 25 students and um, an area called the Fond. The Fond is in the country. Now, they also started a program where they live, which is in Port-au-Prince. So, the, they are staying mainly in Port-au-Prince, and Junior and Jamie, along with a, uh, a gentleman named Jackie, a man named Jackie, is who are the primary educators there. In the countryside, we work along with Pastor, as well as several of the local community, to bring in people from the outside to teach the kids in La Fond, which is way up, it's beautiful, it's in the mountains, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's a nice respite from the heat of court prints, but again, those kids often don't have access to teachers because the teachers don't get paid to go to those areas, so we bring in teachers to help teach these children. We also uh, do sponsor a lunch program, um, and we do sponsor these children to attend. The goal also is by sponsoring these children and allowing them to go to school and providing them things that they need to get this education, um, helps them stay with their families as opposed to becoming rustics or being dropped by their families in an orphanage where they might not really be taken care of. So currently our donors sponsor 89 elementary students, making it possible in total for over 450 students to go to school. So how do we sponsor 89 and get 450 students to go? Because those sponsorships bring in the teachers and then that wouldn't otherwise be available to the students in that area. So while our money sponsors the students, we bring in the teachers and that allows families who are in the area who can afford their children to go to school to provide access to that teacher. So even though we only sponsor 89 kids at the time, if it's 450 still students that are learning from the teachers that we bring in. Uh, we provide two free meals a week in the fund, which totals about 40,000 meals a year for all the students. Um, this year we walk through high school with over 45 students who receive scholarships. So when we're looking at children, we're constantly evaluating them as 
process to it. It's not just giving money and sponsorship, all right? You said, we, we're investing in you and we're investing in the future. So what are you going to do? Are you going to value this education? Are you going to go to schools? What are you doing to help yourself rise? So and un unfortunately, some of that is, is sometimes we have to have hard conversations with some of these kids. Like, and then sometimes we're able to mitigate the situation, like maybe something's going on in the home where they can't attend. People get sick, people get hurt, uh, they can't make it to school, their family fell in hard times, and now they have to work as opposed to um, being able to attend school. So sometimes what we do is that immediate need where maybe we can provide a solution, whether it be in healthcare or a short-term financial solution to help a family so the student can go back to school and learn the skills that they need. Um, but sometimes the child just has fallen to the wayside and there's some times where we just have to stop the sponsorship. And that fortunately has not happened often, but it did happen one time this year. Um, and that's hard, it's hard. So we constantly revisit with that child and that family and keep trying to get them back in the program. So um, we talked about why children can be separated earlier. So why sponsor a high school student? So a lot of times, you know, the goal is to get to these kids early. So when you're sponsoring a high school student, you're investing in them. It's keeping them off the streets where they have a high chance of joining a gang. And uh, a lot of times the young women at that age even become prostitutes. Um, you're giving them resources and tools they need to become an upstanding citizen in their community. Um, it'll challenge them to be leaders who love the people and their country enough to fight for the change within Haiti. So, um, you cannot change a country through charity. You, as being outsiders, even though don't necessarily have every little bit of that culture that you need to know, nor do you necessarily have every little, you're coming in as an outsider. So the best hope for Haiti is not charity, but education, and inspiring these young leaders to take the reins of the country and rise above. Um, I've brought several kids who, um, the information is here, I'll leave it with you all and the sponsors, um, both in LaFond and in Port-au-Prince. Again, I want to focus on some of the things that we're doing. There is also, besides the regular school year, we run summer programs, both in LaFond, which is in Suisse, and in Port-au-Prince. And in those summer programs, we're really focusing on on hard skills. How to, some of these kids don't even know how to go to the market and buy the food that they need. And then how to prepare that food. How to make healthy food as opposed to unhealthy food. How to make soap. How to do construction work. Plumbing. All these things we're building together. A lot of what we do, um, some of you may be in corporations or companies where you went and uh, did team building events. So we do team building events. How to work together. Because that working together, a lot of times, if you if you go in an orphanage and you so let's say you bring some toys and stuff, it's it's a fight if there's only so many toys and usually the strongest gets all the toys. So this is working on sort of breaking that mindset and having people work together as a community so that they can all rise up together. So that's the majority of my presentation. I'm trying to keep it as short and sweet as possible, and I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability and with God's help. Do the child slaves age out, or are they perpetual slaves? So they're perpetual slaves until the family decides they don't want them. Can you repeat the question? Uh, so, uh, Mr. White <laughs> asked me if uh, the, uh, the rest of Vicks, the child slaves, age out. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll become prostitutes. Sometimes they'll become uh, shipped off to a gang or sold to a gang. Uh, sometimes they remain a household slave for their lifetime. Um, right. yes. What what natural resources do they have? Uh, you know, you, we saw where they make soap, uh -huh. um, a building trade. But how about farming and uh, those types of things or anything that's natural resources? Are they trained to uh, take advantage of that? So the question was, yes. So the question was about natural resources. So Haiti 
uh, as you know, is still a very, it still produces coffee. Um, so there are a lot of coffee farms. The farming in the arable la land is very, very interesting. So Haiti was mostly deforested when the Europeans came because they wanted to plant sugar cane. So a lot of the topsoil was washed away. Now, there's been a process of reforestation, um, and there is still a lot of good soil in the mountains. So the farms are incredible. And uh, on the way here, I was talking with Howie about um, my wife makes a joke that, that I'm the only person that goes to a third world country and comes back 10 pounds he heavier. So the fruit there and the vegetables are amazing. Guava, plantains, bananas, sipuan, which is lime, sipuanella, which is a type of fruit, kanep, which is another type of fruit. Like all these different fruits that are very unique to Haiti. And then there's um, cabbage, lettuce, beets. They make a beetroot salad, which is Shocking for me to say because I grew up hating beets, uh, but this is hard to pass up. Um, the, the, from the cabbage, they make this dish called pickles, which is very spicy. So they're a Caribbean island. They like things hot, so there's lots of hot peppers, too, that you put. You make this pickles, and you make, put it on some fried plantains, and it's heaven. Um, there's a, um, also chocolate. There's a lot of chocolate that's grown in Haiti, and they use it mostly locally. That There's some of it that's made it onto the world market. Um, there's also, they, they have um, a lot of fish in the fishing industry. The, they are still doing sugarcane as well. Um, the other thing that's amazing, and if you've never had it, if you can find it, it's expensive, but you might be able to find it on Amazon or online. Haitian vanilla is the best vanilla you will ever have. Better than anywhere in the world, I, I promise you that. Um, it is very unique, it is very potent, when a recipe calls for a teaspoon, you'd want to use two drops of Haitian vanilla because it's very strong. Um, so uh, it's, it's fabulous. And the coffee there is fabulous. So a good way to support it is actually looking for, if, if you're not into this, buying coffee that's grown in Haiti. Uh, there's a group called Singing Rooster, not a part of an organization I am with, but they sell sustainable grown coffee that employs Haitians and works with Haitians. So, yes, there's lots of Sorry, that rambled on the way. That's good. Thank how, you. How, did you, how did you personally get involved with this organization, and why? So specific, so it's interesting. So I, how did I first become involved with this organization, and why? So I first went to Haiti in 2012, and I went with a different group, and we got there. And this group is amazing. Um, they're still active. They're called Awaken Haiti, um, and they work at that time we're mostly doing medical work. This was in 2012, so it was still relatively soon after the earthquake. And I went down and there was a medical clinic set up in a small tent village. And we went there and did uh, work with some Haitian nurses and doctors to provide care that might not have been otherwise provided. Um, so that's sort of what started my journey. And then through the years and learning more about missions and work, um, when I first went there, the very first time I, I was there, I was with Junior. And at that time, Junior's English was not great, but he was a quick learner. And uh, he, he helped me along with our friend Stephanie, who is now a midwife, uh, taught me some Creole, and we worked with him to teach them English. Now, uh, Junior probably speaks English better than I do. Uh, and I'm still working on my career. Um, but this organization came about because through Junior, I met Jamie. And Jamie, as I said, went there and started to reach out and fund. And they fell in love and got married. And so they asked me to come along with them and their vision. Um, I guess it's about three years ago now. And I've been working with the board to reach out and fund ever since. So we have regular board meetings once a month. Um, there was part of our, and the board guidelines are available, I believe, online, but we are supposed to go once a year down there to check on things and make sure everything's running smoothly. Uh, but unfortunately, the last time I was in Haiti was 2019. I had gone almost every year since 2012. Um, but with the increasing gang violence, um, the travel become a little bit more dangerous. And so we are all hoping to go together 
in late September, October of this year, um, because things are finally starting to calm down, um, and it should be safe for us to go. Now, there is one town when we go, because we do work in Port, and we also work in uh, La Fonte, and La Fonte is in the city, so port of if you look at is sort of kind of in the middle of where Haiti is. There's a big part of the south and a big part of the north. So in order to avoid going through that town, you have to charter a plane and, and fly and land on this uh, very interesting runway. So it's an adventure. Um, but it's beautiful. Actually, in Jacques Mel, I think it's, and I'll get it wrong, it's one of the Columbus's ships was uh, scuttled in that, and so that, that actual... Columbus, yeah, Christopher Columbus ships is in Haiti still. So and they have found and brought up the anchor from that ship. So hmm. it's a Caribbean island. It's beautiful. There's it's, I'll talk a little bit more. When we go, we always make a little bit of time for fun. Um, and one of the most amazing places is called the Blue Holes. And the water is almost uh, if you've ever been high in the mountains, you know, sometimes you'll get that sort of glacial water that can be this electric blue. Well this water is high in the mountains but it's 80, 90 degrees, and it's cold, and it's this electric blue, and you can jump, cliff jump, cliff dive, or just go for a swim, and that's, it's incredible. So, yeah, love it. <laughs> yes. Okay. How does your organization measure success? So how do we measure success? So we, like I said, so we measure success one child at a time, mostly. And so um, basically that involves meeting with the children, trying to walk through them. As we started, we just had sort of our first graduating class of high school students. Um, and so seeing them find jobs and moving forward is the big thing. So are they able to provide for themselves and no longer have to rely on outside organizations for their help? Now, are they able to stay away from gangs? So each, each individual, we try and look at it as each individual, and they're not always going to be successful as but that's the goal of walking with them as opposed to just hanging out with them. So. Hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. As you know, uh, they share a border with the Dominican Republic. Is there any social or political crossing there? Or are they pretty much the same, their own country? <laughs> Uh, so the question was about Haiti's relationship to the Dominican Republic. So the last time I was there in 2019, uh, the, the DR passed a law that essentially made all Haitians uh, illegal. And so when we arrived, that meant that people from Haiti who had been living in the Dominican might have been third generation Dominican quote, Haitian Dominicans, spoke Spanish, they didn't speak Haitian Creole or French, uh, found, suddenly found themselves being illegal aliens and they were forced to cross the border back into Haiti. Haiti was already struggling at that time. Uh, most of those individuals were forced <coughs> into uh, ten cities. And uh, so the relationship between the DR and Haiti is not good. You talk about sponsoring the, the kids. Is public education not free? Is it, is it cost them to go to school? So, yes and no. Yes, there is some public education, but um, the teachers don't ever always get paid because the Haitian government doesn't always work. So to ensure you have a teacher, especially in these rural areas, the teachers get paid. Right? And so if you can't afford having a teacher come in, there's no teacher that's going to come in. Uh, one of the examples I'll see, when I was working with a Haitian physician, uh, he had graduated, had been a doctor for two years, and I think he had been paid twice in two years for two months' salary. So he, of course, was working as a doctor, seeing his kids, but needed help from, this was a different organization, to be able to continue to, to see these kids. And that's the other thing. So there's free health care, but the health care. Um, we had a situation where a child died. A child was having an asthma attack, was brought to the hospital, hooked up to the oxygen, and the person that brought him in 
left to go grab an inhaler, came back, and the baby was infant was dead uh, because there's they were hooked up to the tube, but there was no oxygen flowing through the tube. So, yeah. Yes. How prevalent is sickle cell anemia? So it's pre it's it's prevalent, you know. So. Um, so the original inhabitants of Haiti were the Taino Indians, and they sort of were wiped out by, by many things, disease, war. Uh, and if you go back in, um, in history, just this is sort of a diversion, but sometimes getting the historical perspective is, so when the French colonized Haiti, um, the French were dropping over and dying of, of the, the tropical diseases as well. So they needed people to work, and when they brought over European immigrants, they'd bring them over, and it was, uh, I'm not gonna quote a number, but a vast number of the, those uh, workers died from tropical diseases. So they found that um, bringing over slaves from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they were more resistant to those tropical diseases and more likely to survive. So, because they were brought over from Sub-Saharan Africa, I probably could look it up and give you an exact number, but a sickle cell, at least trait is prevalent, and full-blown anemia is also pretty prevalent. So, and as you know, sickle cell evolved in Sub-Saharan Africa to, uh, as a way to prevent malaria from being deadly. People who have at least sickle cell trait and even sometimes sickle cell anemia are less likely to die from um, malaria. From I did not know that. <laughs> no. Yes, sir. The, the, you, you talked uh, uh, about the, the wonderful agricultural um, product. Is, is the land controlled by just a few landowners or yeah, I mean, because if, if you have successful farms, that would seem to be an economic engine. Okay. So the question was about like who controls the land and the farms. And, uh, that, without a very functioning government, is always in question. So who owns land and who has titles? So there's the question of what is or what is not private property uh, is challenging. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, France donated to Haiti, uh, I think it was several hundred million dollars for them to build a uh, waste management facility. There's really no good waste management facility. So that honey went to the government, um, and then the government, the person who was president at the time, all his friends said, oh, I own this piece of land, where are you gonna build it? Oh, I own this piece of land. So all of that several hundred million dollars went to uh, that president's friends, and then there was no money left to build. So in the countryside, titles are always up for grabs. So the farmers live there, often in small communities. They work together as a community, but there was nothing stopping someone who had money from coming and saying, you know, you're working on my land, you're gonna have to get off now. So uh, it's sort of, uh, it's who you know. And if you can get a title, and then it could be gone in an instant. So I'm trying to work with the government to recognize some of those communities is, is a big challenge. A lot of times in Haiti, um, this is true in a lot of Central and South America, taxation is based on property. But the property, like if you build a house, if the house isn't finished, the house isn't taxed. So when you go to Haiti, you'll see lots of houses with rebar sticking out and unfinished walls and things like that because then they can claim they're not finished so they don't have to pay the tax. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of common. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Same thing. Like a good guy in Western Pennsylvania who did that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I imagine. So, yeah. Not unheard of in many places. <coughs> So is there a police infrastructure of any sort? Uh, can you talk about a lot of lawlessness? Uh, is, there, well, is, there a police, is there a police? So the question was, is there a police structure? And yes, there is police, and yes, there's military. But the police are often outgunned. 
uh, many times out front. So they'll go into an area where there's a gang, and the police usually don't come out on the victorious side of that. Battle. So, uh, and you know, sometimes and there's also corruption in the in some of the police as well. You know, they'll sort of run interference for what's going on. Now, all that to say, um, and I'll explain this. So. Um, Sometimes when you're doing mission work, you find yourselves in Haiti, you find yourself working with the gangs. And here's, I'm gonna explain that a little bit. I have not, this was with another organization, but sort of I have friends that are Mexican, or go to Mexico and visit Mexico. And in certain parts of Mexico, when you go into a certain town, you go to the cartel leader and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm the daughter of so-and-so, and then you're fine. But if you don't go and let them know that, then you could be subject to things you would rather not be subject to. So in certain parts of Haiti, there was one time I was staying in a place, and the gang leader in the area was very mad about something that happened that the government did. So he cut the power to the whole neighborhood. And so uh, through negotiations and discussions, we got him to see, hey, we have children here, you know, you're not going to inspire them to sort of like, I guess, as the mafia in the olden days would portray, like they're helping, you know, rice and stuff. You, you know, could you please turn the power back on so we can feed our kids and the power that's turned back on? So, um, you know, God didn't ask us to come for the people that are already saved. He came to tell us Jesus was there to work with the sinners, right? So. Jesus was with the prostitutes and the tax collectors, and sometimes that's where you need to go to, to work with them to hopefully change their minds and their outlooks and get them to see a new vision. Do you get a chance during this work to bring the gospel to these students as well? Absolutely, yeah. Especially in the fun where we work directly with the pastor and the church. So he's the one that usually comes since Junior and Jamie since travel is restricted in junior and junior aren't there as much, he sort of helps identify the families, works with the families, religious education, and so sort of that is walking with them. And also when we're doing our summer program, a lot of it is about, you know, um, talking to them about God and Jesus. Everything that can be gained. What do you see denominationally there? Um, so there's a joke, and I said this to Howard, so They'll say uh, Haiti is 98% Catholic, 2% uh, Protestant, and 100% Voodoo. Uh, it's not entirely true, but so especially when the Catholics came in, the Catholics have a lot of saints, and uh, the Haitians took those saints and sort of transferred them into their Voodoo deities. So the uh, Catholic priests wouldn't know what was going on, but the Haitians knew what was going on. So, but I think as things have changed, over the years, especially over the last two decades, there really is more of an increasing sort of belief in God and letting go. That's good. That was probably true back in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, during um, sort of Papa Doc and Baby Doc. And if you don't know about them, that's what they were. Uh, they were. They were around the same time as, uh, that was an interesting time for the island in general because it was Papa Doc and then Baby Doc. And then over in the DR, you had Trujillo. So you had these two countries side by side with crazy dictators. So. I remember Doonesbury running comics on those. Oh, oh gosh, yes. Yeah. 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 You said earlier you haven't been there since 2019. Do you miss it? So the question was, I haven't been there since 2019. Uh, do I miss it? Terrible. Um, I think. I think about my friends there a lot because um, through the years you, we've made several friends, several connections. Um, there's just these kids that I've known since they were little and they're growing up and they're moving on and they're doing wonderful things. My friend Stephanie, who became a midwife, um, she's working with a group called Heartline, which provides uh, maternal care with the pastors that I've met going to. Going to church in Haiti is an experience. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, different because I'm Presbyterian, so you know I go to church and we sit and we sing and we sing passionately. But in Haiti, it's singing, it's passionate, right? <laughs> it's, it's worshiping. And 
and full so body it's a, singing. Right? Yeah, it's a whole different, a whole different story. And so it takes me out of my comfort zone as a good, good Presbyterian, but, it, but it's fun. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. How much um, do you have a focus on getting medical supplies in for your students? Um, tuberculosis is a problem there. Uh, not as much. A lot. So the question was, how do we get medical supplies into the country for our students? And so, uh, again, like I have gone. So, technically, it's illegal to bring in medical supplies in your suitcase because if you get caught with them. Uh, but again, as in a lot of Latin America and the Caribbean, sometimes a little bit of cash to the right person will get you through. That's not advice, and I don't recommend you do that, but I'm just saying if you're ever in a situation. So mostly what we do is we try and go about it the correct way by bringing it in through shipping containers. You have to pay tax on it. Or they do have supplies um, that are shipped in from around the world that the government buys, but they're not necessarily in the hospitals. There are, med there are plenty of medicines there, so it's going to the pharmacies in Haiti. And, and that actually is probably the better way because then you're supporting the local economy as well as getting the medicines directly to the people that need them. So sometimes, again, that's sort of, sort of more of an immediate thing then. The goal, eventual goal being that these kids getting jobs, getting educations, will be able to go out and buy their own medications. Right now, that's not the situation in a lot of the country. So. Yes? Farmers Earth uh, program for growing moringa trees is still going on. Okay, so the question was, is there a program for growing mango trees? I, not I, not mango, no. moringa. Moringa. There are, it's a tree that provides protein, total protein, and it is. They, I think they do have it in. But so that really using it. I might know that under a different name. So there was a question about growing a tree that provides is a sustenance tree. Um, I'm not familiar with that. So. Well, it was a Presbyterian, uh, one of our workers there, who was introducing it to the farmer. And I mean, his wife delivered an eight pound something baby because she was eating this, and he was trying to tell all his other friends, you gotta start growing these little trees. <laughs> yeah. And I just didn't know what was still going on. It was on the border. Yeah. <clears throat> it's on the Haitian Dominican border. And I okay. think it's a Presbyterian Mission coworker, I think, was doing it. I believe they, you. I'm just yeah, not apparently really helped uh, in pregnancies and all that. Much healthier babies and better lactation and all that. So. You, you dried it, ground it up, use it as a meal. Yeah, you can mix it with it. Huh. I'll have to look into that and learn more about it. I think, yeah, Moringa was the name. Moringa. Moringa okay. was the name of that, but maybe yeah. some other name. Yeah. yeah. I'll look and see. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know more about it. So I'm assuming there's no McDonald's or Burger Kings on the corners in Haiti. <laughs> um, what are what are some yeah. of your favorite foods that you ran into down there that you like to bring home? Oh my gosh! So uh, but what what got the ten pounds on you while you were down there? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know it's Caribbean food, so it's sort of hot and spicy. They make a lot of the street food. Uh, it's it's called uh, uh, fritai, which stands for basically catch up of fried food. So they make, it's, if you've ever had like a Jamaican patty, it's similar to that. It's sort of a dough, and then inside is vegetables and meat, and it's fried in oil, and it's fantastic. Um, they t have a root called okra, which is not our okra. It's a different kind of root. And you smash it up, and uh, you put the pickles, which is the spicy cabbage on that. That's fantastic. Fried plantains. The fish, poisson, is amazing. Um, it's fresh ocean fish. Uh, they like to eat it spicy in the typical Caribbean style with everything on it, head, eyes, all that good stuff. Um, pork is called grillo, and grillo is a fried pork, amazing. We cabrit, which is goat, and goat is delicious. The beef, which is uh, beef, beef steak, is good. There's a, Haiti, interestingly, has a very big contest once a year with uh, which restaurant in Port au Prince or in the country makes the best hamburger. Mm -hmm. So the hamburgers are amazing there. There's always uh, contests for that. Um, the fresh fruit, mango, 
uh, citron, which is lime, citronella, which is a specific fruit to Haiti, canaps, which is specific fruit to Haiti. They have cherries, but they're different types of cherries. Oh, just amazing. And then they'll make a gisouan, which is a mixture of like lime juice and uh, citronella. And that is incredible for breakfast. Um, for breakfast, interestingly enough, Haitians like to eat um, uh, pasta. And uh, all pasta is called spaghetti. So they make uh, spaghetti for manger matin, which is pasta for breakfast, usually with sauce, sometimes a bean sauce, sometimes a red sauce. Um, it's often served with eggs, eggs or zay, um, say a fromage, the cheese is really good that they have there. I mean, just incredible. The chocolate, like I mentioned, is amazing. Um, the, the desserts they have are amazing. I, I could go on and on. I mean, just, yeah, just you show up and, you know, it's, and, and everybody, um, so we talked a little bit about cultural differences. So European cultures are typically referred to as cold cultures, so we're not, as emotive or expressive, um, and, and sort of Caribbean cultures, maybe Sub-Saharan Africa are known as hot cultures. So when you go to Haiti, it's, you, you'll hear two people talking, and it sounds like they're angry at each other, or they're yelling, or they're really loud, and they're not. They're just, that's how they engage, and that's how they show love and respect. When you walk in, you're greeting someone, it's the kiss on the cheek, it's the handshake, You'll walk down the street and you'll see two men holding hands, and they're holding hands not, not because of a physical relationship. It means you have my attention. I am all yours, and we are going to have this moment together that's just our moment. It's like a brotherly love. Um, and so although there are dangerous parts in Haiti, I have never felt, um, never felt threatened. I've always felt loved and cared for. And... You know, people who go anywhere, whether it's Haiti or other places, but for me, Haiti, like it's, it's people who would do anything for you to help you in any way. So, so I love it. Food's good. People are even better. <laughs> it's another one. Good yeah. to know. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? It's about as much. I could probably talk about Haiti forever. So um, if hopefully as the situation improves, um, and it's, it's had a sad history. Um, there were, when the UN was there, one of the countries that was involved in Haiti set up um, prostitution rings with young women. Um, it, was, it was not the US, it was another nation. And so some of those prostitution rings still exist. Uh, but the, Haiti has been uh, really hit hard by forces outside their control. So, the goal is to sort of limit those external influences and build the culture. And, and go from there. I remember shortly after the earthquake, the Nigerians brought cholera. Yeah. Has that been controlled? So the cholera is pretty well controlled at this point. It's better. A lot of what we see there, like really common in germs. So it was interesting during, um, anyway, uh, one of the medicines that was in the news we use all the time there as a demoning medicine. So we give it to kids from six months on up. Um, probably twice a year we get it. We'll hold off on the names and things. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, so we see a lot of that. There's a lot of uh, there's still a lot of transmissible infections that are spread. Out. Any tropical diseases that come through, uh, there's chikungunya. Um, and I blank on the one that made it all over the Florida. Uh, mostly viral diseases in China. Thank you. are going to get it anyway, so they stop taking the, the preventative things <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and just deal with having malaria. Just surrender to the natural environment. There you go. Yeah. 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 And the funny thing is, is, though I work with this group specifically, a lot of the missionaries there, they have a network and they know each other and they work together. One of the things I asked is, you know, there's been missionaries going to Haiti for forever, so why, why hasn't there been any change? And I guess, I guess it has to do with what I said at the beginning. I think originally a lot of what was done was immediate need and charity work, and now as we're learning more about doing mission work in a way to rise up, there's more hope that comes to change.
you want to make mention of any way they can give to the cause? Yes, um, the easiest way is you're always welcome. Um, Jack has my, my email. You're always email, welcome to email me any questions. But the easiest way is to just type in uh, reach out, one word, and then LaFont, L-A-F-O-N-D, into your web browser. It's the first thing that pops up. Junior and Jamie, they have explanations of what they do, where the needs are. Uh, there's a ways to contact them on there if you have any specific questions. Um, they're two of the most amazing people I know in this world, so um, they're great. Um, and certainly, they'll, they'll be even better at answering any questions than I am, because they, they are in-country you know, year-round. How, how does your organization stand against the gangs? There's a lot, there has to be a lot of pressure. You have what they want, resources, talent, the kids. How, how, how does that, does, is there conflict? You... Um, so some of that I can talk about and some of it. Um, so, so what I'm trying to do is sort of walk the line here because like, I can't talk too much about it because of risk for um, junior and junior. So it's, it is walking a line at times. And it is sometimes working to find a better way to bring them out of a situation that they might otherwise be. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, it does. Um, Junior and Jamie, I'm not going to speak for them too much on that. It's sometimes it's a sticky one. Junior has been um, has been accosted several times with guns and other things. But, Junior is an amazing talker. If you're ever in a situation and you need to get out of it, ask for Junior. <laughs> Led by the Lord. I've seen him talk to people on the streets who would argue with him against uh, Christianity and then just sit back and listen to him go. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, so much. very much. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. I didn't think I had it in the beginning. Thank you so much.